Uh, hi, welcome everyone. Uh, for today's chapter, we'll be covering deep learning. Uh, I will be using also a note from I, the, the previous cohort for ISLR. Uh, and maybe if there is some content that they do, do not specify, uh, we can take a look at the book. Uh, the author does mention that this is the hardest chapter in all of the book. Um, also in the examples, uh, when well, they are not, there, there are not too many of them compared to other chapters, but at least I, I, I did find the theory quite interesting. So let's take a look. So the author describes that the base of this type of, of models of deep learning is what it is called the neural network. And despite the fact that this was invented I think it's not, not even uh, 980s in the book, I mean, should they say 970s? Oh no, or here. around this date, uh, it has only been kind of recently that this type of model has uh, like produced remarkable results. Uh, and the author also says that that's probably in part to, uh, to the fact that in this modern era, there is an abundance of data. So such abundance uh, helps a lot this type of models. Uh, the first type of, or perhaps uh, the most basic one, the type of model that we are going to be taking a look at over here, let's see, it's called a single layer neural network. Uh, we have, for this case, our pre-predictors and as usual, we are trying to estimate uh, the response function, sorry, the, the function to, to make our predictions. However, in this case, the final function to get the predictions, we are not going to construct it in, in some linear fashion out of the predictors, but in, in a sort of iterative way of manipulating them, via nonlinear functions in many steps, in, in many steps, or also called the many layers. So as we can see for our final function to estimate the, uh, the real pattern that is happening between the predictors and the response, it's going to be in a sense, uh, well, the author calls it linear, a linear function, but I think really the more, the more precise term is affine in, in the sense of what is an affine function. Uh, and that is simply a linear function that, uh, as it says over here, linear plus a constant. So I'm going to keep calling it affine due to this possible inter non-zero intercept. Uh, and so it says, in that sense, we're constructing an affine function, uh, not directly from the data, but from uh, iterative nonlinear conversions of it. This type of conversions, uh, let's see, uh, these get performed in what they are called hidden layers. Yeah, these are the steps where the input gets transformed in nonlinear ways. Uh, and the notation that they have been using in the book is this one over here. This, I think, is called activation function. Well, this function performs some nonlinear manipulation, well, nonlinear transformation of our <laughs> of our inputs, of our predictors. Um, and in, in the sense in which they do that, this type of transformation, well, if I understood correctly, is that once you start creating, creating your model, you fix a particular nonlinear transformation. Uh, let's call it G. This is this type of function. And what you do is this activation function is simply uh, composing G with also some affine transformation of your data. Uh, well, where these are simply numbers that, well, later on we will have to, to fit for our model to be usable. Uh, so in that sense is that we are considering, well, we have our predictors, we make affine transformations of, of them, but then we compose them via nonlinear functions. Uh, and that is the, 
nonlinear conformation of the data from which in this particular case of a single layer, uh, in this case, it is from such activation functions that then our, let's call it a predictor function is going to be simply also an affine transformation, but now of the transform inputs. And our here they mentioned <clears throat> a couple of examples for for this nonlinear function that we we fixed in the beginning. It's called ah, it's a, it's called the activation function. For example, this one we are already familiar with. This uh, we saw in the case of logistic regression, and in and the interesting part is that it inputs not sorry, it outputs your your input value to a number between zero and one. So we can interpret it as a probability. Uh, however, they also mentioned that at least in now in modern applications, uh, this activation function is not is not really as used compared to this one over here. That is basically uh, the absolute value, but converted to zero is negative. As we can see in this graph, in the this black line. Okay, and this is the structure of what we have been describing. We have our input layer, these are our P predictors. And we transform them in some nonlinear way. These are our, well, I thought they, these were called activation functions. What, what is the actual name of this A sub K? Do you, do you remember? Do you, does anyone of you remember? No, I'm not sure. Was it? Ah, activation. I that was the activation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Lydia. Okay. So we have our predictors, uh, the activations. Uh, and we can see from the arrows, uh, each one of them is taking all of the inputs into account. Uh, and then from an affine combination of these activations, we get our, our estimate function. Uh, for which we predict on the response. Uh, well, over here is simply a, a brief comment about uh, what, what is the what is the use of these coefficients? And um, as they mentioned, they are kind of weights. Uh, like a sense of measure of the importance of these variables. Uh, in, in the end, well, not in the end, but when we fit the model, still, uh, these coefficients, uh, still, they look have to be fitted. I think it's in the in this part. Well, it's in the book. Maybe it is not over here. But but I also described how the the fitting occurs, at least numerically, and it's not. Like it has a, a complete solution. I mean, there is no a already determined solution for the global optimum because it's it's a non-complex problem. So over here we can see an example of this case. Let's see, we have two input variables, uh, x1 and x2. And we can specify some particular values of these uh, coefficient estimates. Over here, this would be the weights for the predictors, uh, and these beta coefficients would be, well, also the weights, but the weights of the activation. So the ones that we use for the final uh, estimated function, as we can see in this part of Fx. Uh, and in the case of, um, because this model also works for a, uh, quantitative a response or, or categorical one. They mentioned that in the case of quantitative, uh, the, the usual uh, criteria to, to fit your model is a uh, basic uh, mean square error. Uh, and for the case of qualitative response, uh, I think they also mentioned this, this value. Well, this type of number, uh, when we were covering the part about about decision trees, 
And it's basically this formula over here. Finally, uh, the comment that they, they mentioned about uh, now after after performing the the activations of the functions, how can you get a uh, certain probability? Now, how, how can you map those numbers up to a probability? And that's why they describe this type of function where after performing this transformation to tower activations, zeta sub k up to zeta sub m, no up to now, over across all the sets that we have available, uh, this particular transformation, it does uh, give us a range of, of numbers between zero and one. So in a way it can be interpreted as a probability. That a certain, uh, the probability that a, that a certain class uh, is the one predicted. Okay, let's skip the lab and continue with the next case. And uh, over here we can see the idea of this, uh, well, not really recursion, but iterative steps that, that, that I mentioned in the beginning, because now we are not using a single layer. Now we're using two. Uh, that's why we also have a different notation. Now we're using super scripts for these activations. Um, at least from from the actual drawing, we can we can get a sense that uh, a similar a similar process is, is taking place for this now new hidden layer, the second one, and and that and that is because as we saw for this first layer, each each one of these activations takes into account a fine transformations of the of the values in the previous layer, and then assigns a, a sorry and then uses some fixed function, the activation function, to, to convert them in, in some nonlinear way. That is similar for all of these activations. And now a similar case happens for this second layer. For example, for this activation A sub one, no, A two sub one, we can see that the input data that, that is taking is not the actual predictors, but the 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 results from the previous activation, so as if these were the 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 inputs, the predictors for our model, uh, and it and it computes a similar step of taking a fine combinations of these values, and then using I think it's the same activating function. I don't know if it, if maybe in some model in, in some other models they they change the activate the activation function for for different layers. Uh, and in the in the final part, in this case, at least for this for this example of a categorical response, and uh, also similar process happens that these functions are generated again as a, a fine combination of these uh, inputs from the previous layer. In this case, these second activations. Let's see, there is a comment. Ah, thank you, Ricardo. Uh, okay, so this type of neural network is one of the one of the the cases that we were discussing before starting the meeting, uh, and that is that this type of models uh, have had quite a bit of success in the realm of image classification, uh, and for that particular problem, uh, some of the type of neural networks that are used are in particular these ones, a convolutional neural network. Uh, the main idea is that out of the data of the out of the input data, this neural network is going to try to find like important local no important local patterns maybe in, in images. And then now that we have uh, like many instances of important each local patterns, try to get a sense of, okay, out of all of this, 
which are the most important, and then filter some out. And then now that we have, now that we have this process of taking a bit of, sorry, of recognizing important uh, local patterns, maybe in an image, is that we can keep cleaning the data for the actual projection that is going to take place in the last step. Uh, and, and this sort this sort of procedure is going to take place in, in this sense. Uh, these local patterns or local features that we are looking for in an image. Uh, this process is taking place in what it is called a convolutional, uh, not the filters or convolutional layers, I think it was the name. Uh, and then for the other part that I described about identifying which of those local features were the most important in, in the previous step, we're we are using what it is called uh, the spooling layers. Uh, and specifically, they are, they are a type of uh, dimension dimension reduction, in particular, via this, via this factor, a factor of two in each x and y direction you know, of the image. The, the theta axis is simply the, the color. This one, uh, there, uh, sorry, there is a comment. I was going to say, these ones, I don't know if you've ever saw, like, online, they have, like, the pictures of, like, a face of a chihuahua and then, like, a chocolate chip muffin or a chocolate chip muffin or, like, a cookie that only has, like, three, uh, um, that only has, like, three chocolate chips. And, like, they'll use that to try and decipher which is a chocolate chip cookie and which is a chihuahua or the face of a chihuahua. Yeah, I think, I'm guessing that's, like, what those are used for, like, the convolutional neural network kind of deciphering between those two. Yeah, I'll I get a picture. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think there was even a case, maybe not too many years ago, I think it was a, a Japanese uh, laboratory. They were they were making, a, I, I think, um, a deep learning model to detect croissants. However, they later found out that such model was even better predicting breast cancer. So something like that. I don't know, it's pretty weird. Uh, I wanted to show over here some of the parts that they show in the book. For example, over here, uh, from this, well, this would be a, a, an observation, so an instance of, no, a particular input, sorry, out of this image. Uh, this was some of the ideas that we are talking about uh, with respect to local features. That is, for example, the, in, this, in this case, right, they are talking about maybe detection of an eye or a mouth or an ear. <coughs> And then, in, well, this could be, I guess, a convolutional layer. And then in this next, in this next step of the pooling layer, uh, they are not only, actually, they are not only filtered out, but I think they also comment that they are, in a way, assembled. For example, as we can see over here, for for what is what, for what is the ear, it has been combined, these two factors, into one. So like a filter and combine. Uh, well, because there is no comment over here in the in the in the notes from ISLR, maybe just a a quick comment. Uh, there is a comment in the chat. Okay, let's open it right now. Chihuahua or muffin, my search for the for the best computer vision API. Oh, it's okay. I'm not sure if the computer vision is the same exact thing, but yeah, that picture of like, is it a muffin or is it a chihuahua? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Okay, pretty interesting. Uh, about this convolution uh, procedure, I mean, mathematically, what is, happen what is happening is uh, this process, in a sense, is a type of moving average. For example, you have your convolution filter is a matrix, and then you apply it. In this case, this is a, the representation of the image, and then you apply this matrix, like 
uh, per blocks. For example, as you can see from this first item, that is, that is the case of taking a, taking this uh, square matrix A B D E and multiplying it. No way, everything. Um, now it would be A B D E multiplying it with this one or with this other matrix and then well flattening it flattening in that two dimensional matrix into a one dimensional one and um, we yeah, this simple sum of the elements and similarly over here you have these two by two matrix B C E F you multiply it by your convolution filter and then the sum of the elements uh, is what is being represented uh, over here. And changing the convolution filter, uh, that may depend on, for example, which type of, of feature are you looking for in the image? Maybe a particular border you're looking for in the image, uh, or perhaps a uh, a region of the image that it is like a long vertical line. I, I think they mentioned something like for those cases, your convolution filter is basically a zero matrix, but one of the columns is full of ones. Uh, and such and such, uh, we, are, we are changing this convolution filter. You also decide uh, which geometrical feature of the image you are interested in, in capturing. And yeah, that's why they also show over here about com about capturing vertical stripes or vertical lines, as we can see over here, or more interested in capturing horizontal or horizontal ones like over here. Uh, and as we saw. In the case of the single layer, it really, it really, uh, sorry, there is a comment. Okay, thank you, Ricardo. Uh, for a later on. Okay. Uh, as I was saying, uh, we are not limited to using, well, now these two types of layers, but they can also be combined. So, for example, performing convolutions out of the filter or pooling layer that happened in the previous step from the previous convolution and such and such. Um, uh, and if, uh, sorry, there was a comment. Is the idea that like the convolution is kind of like, like what the activation was in the other one? Or is it, it's kind of totally different? Hmm. Well, before letting Ricardo make that clear, because he has, he has more experience in that, at least I, I would suppose that not, they are not that similar. Uh, maybe in the sense that we do fix something in the beginning, for example, for this convolution layer, we fix the, the convolution filter, that is the, the matrix, right? To get a sense of which geometrical feature we want to capture. But then, but then, I mean, th that was it. Like that, that defined the convolution layer. However, in the case of the activations, as we saw, even after you define the activation function, there are some coefficients, I think it's here. There are some coefficients that we have to estimate uh, for the affine transformation of the, of the data. So, so maybe uh, they are not that similar, I don't know. And what do you think, Ricardo? Uh, the, the link that I provided, uh, it explains, you know, how the convolution works. And usually what it does is for an image, it kind of deconstructs the image in, you know, a, in a matrix of one and zeros. Okay. That first, first step of the convolution is really uh, deconstructing that image into one and zeros 
so the deep learning algorithm can understand, you know, uh, you know, it can ingest that uh, representation of the image. Okay, and depending right on the on the interactions between these matrices of zeros and ones, then you get the weight, you know, for each of the parameters that you are defining, and then you get the you get the the prediction. Okay, but yeah, uh, the convolution is basically that. It's a, it's a transformation of that image. Okay, that has, you know, let's say uh, a white will be uh, zero, 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 right? And then all black will be one, 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 one. Between those, you know, uh, gradients of one and zeros in that matrix, then you get the raw material that you need for the deep learning to then start uh, doing the weights. All right. Over here, they also mentioned the use of kernel for these filters because mm -hmm. in, in other contexts uh, where I was seeing something about image classification, they also right. talk about a kernel for, for these transformations of the image. There, I think it was, there is something called even the a Gaussian kernel. I think it was to blur the, the image here. I don't remember, but there are even other yes. matrices or particular type of kernels where you actually can almost only from that matrix uh, detect the, the edges of the image simply by combining along the the matrix representation of the image. So I guess in a way it's similar over here, this kernel right. filter. So ju just trying to answer uh, Lydia's question in terms of if it is an activation or not, uh, this one is more like a pre-processing, the convolution. It's more like a pre-processing of the original data to then uh, input it into the in, in into the hidden layer, okay? You know where the activation really really uh, occurs. So it's it's it's, it's kind of a pre a, a pre process uh, step there. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you, Ricardo. And let's see the next the next uh, case is about this recurring neural networks. Uh, this this comes up, this one come up in the case where your data has a time, has a dependency with time, for example, something with time series, for example. Uh, but in the sense that some observations are dependent uh, in from previous ones. Uh, I think for this one I didn't really quite get the mathematical part. Uh, so maybe let's take a look at the book. Ah, uh, wait, we're completely skipping over document classification. Uh, okay. Let's see, it says, for example, ah, well, not only time series, there's also a well, pretty basic example in the case of, of document, for example, to analyze if some particular review, it's being positive or negative. And, well, and also this one is quite highlighted in this part of the book, because now for this type of neural network, this uh, interaction, well, between the words, right? Because they come one after the other. Now it's it's been taken into account. However, for the other case of simply uh, for this case that I mentioned, uh, it's not really the order of the words that is being taken into account for the model, but the presence. And of course, that probably is not enough to get a, a good predictions of this of sentiment analysis. Uh, so over here, now our input object, uh, as I mentioned, it is a sequence because there is an importance in the past. Uh, for example, this would be a sequence of words to represent simply a sentence. Uh, 
Uh, and now the, or the order of this, uh, it does matter. Uh, uh, what else? Mm. Over here, for example, there is a change in the activation function. No, sorry, in the activations. Uh, as we saw in the case of the single layer, we only had this term, this affine transformation of the data, but now it's also taking into account. Uh, now, so there are some other combinations, but now of the previous activations, as you can see. Uh, Over here, this one, this layer in particular is taking into account. I think it's only the previous one. Well, I'm not sure if it's only taking into account the previous activation or what is it representing? Sorry, what is it representing with this uh, second index that it is changing? Ah, uh, it has to be, yeah, 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 it has to be, it's taking, this, this layer is taking into account all of the activations from the previous layer. Uh, and also, well, we are recursion because it's doing that in a way, it's also taking into account all of the previous ones. Because, for example, for the previous layer, this one also depends on the previous one. So it, it is keeping track of the, of the past, of the past activations, thanks to this sort of average that when it later on gets transformed. Ah, and, and it does seem to be the case that transform still via the same activation function fixed in the beginning. Uh, there, there is a couple of comments. Okay. Yeah, Thank I you. just put something in the chat about um, NLP because I was looking at it. I was like, that kind of sounds like NLP. <laughs> so yeah, I found there's a book, uh, Modern Approaches in Natural Language Processing, and they had, I guess it's their introductory one, Deep Learning for NLP. I just figured in case it's of interest to anyone, just putting it back there. Uh, this is a book in R or, or mostly I... about the concepts? Let me see, I don't know. I just, I just Googled, yeah, so I don't know if yeah. it's written in there. Let me see. It's on GitHub. Yeah, I, I think so far in, in the book lab, there haven't really been like deep learning specific oriented book labs. Or have they? Um, I think not. I don't know if there are too much, but just in case anyone wanted to know about okay. neural networks and NLP. Because okay. when you were discussing it, it sounded familiar. Uh, well, so right here, they are simply performing the, the MSC that we have already been covering, but now as we can see, due to this, taking into account of the past layers, uh, also the formula changes, and uh, so would the, the type of uh, optimization for it. However, I guess in part that they mentioned over here, well, I think it's not in the, in the notes, or maybe it's this, this. Let me check first. What's application? No, I think it's not. But it is in this sense that there is some type of regularization needed and that it can be applied for these models. Um, but even a step before that, for example, in the case of only taking into account if a word was or not present in the text or, or in a review, that uh, well, for those cases, each word got mapped to a, a vector of zeros, except for except for one entry. Uh, that one would be the specific identifier for the word. Um, however, in that case, for example, as we can see for this particular example, uh, the input data, it can be in a way quite high dimensional, but in a sense that it's not necessary for it to be so high dimensional. It can be reduced. For example, over here, we're, we're talking about, I don't know, maybe like 
a space of 20 dimensions, just in order to encode if a word is present or not. Um, but if dimensionality is an issue, uh, they also mentioned that you can embed this, well, in this case, I think it's almost like 20 dimensional space into a lower one. Uh, and yes, it says, I think it's 20 words, so yeah, 20 dimensions, uh, embedded, embedded into a, a space of only five. And now your vector, that it was only zeros, except for one, that except for one, except for one entry that was a value of one. Now we get mapped to, in this case, uh, also a vector, now in R5, but now it's not only zeros, it can be really any real number. Uh, and in that sense, I mean, this dimension, dimensionality reduction can be quite important. Also, because when we are when we are working with many layers, as we saw for each layer, you have many coefficients to estimate. And now if you have many of them, sometimes you can even have more coefficients to estimate than actual observations. So either an approach like this of dimensionality reduction or an approach that I think it's covered a little bit later in the chapter about regularization. Uh, it can be pretty useful for the model to be more accurate and not have overfitting. Um, see, well, they mentioned a part about time series. Uh, there was an interesting part about it. Now, maybe just before that, only a quick comment about this, about when to use deep learning. Uh, well, in a sense, even though it's becoming more and more popular, this type of tools, uh, as I also mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, now, they are, now these tools are even taking, not a central, but they are taking an active part of our daily lives. For example, in, in my work, many of the people over there, uh, they use ChatGPT all day for their for their tasks. Uh, so in that sense, maybe one could think that, oh, if I have a problem, maybe the first tip to go or or, or first, first possible solution to evaluate would be to use the learning to solve it. However, as I mentioned, well, first, one of the of the great contributors for this type of models to to be so effective is in the case where you have a, a ton man, but really a, a bunch of abundant data. Uh, however, that's probably not the case in general. Maybe for a small company, that's probably not the case. So they do a, a small well a short comparison between a basic. Uh, Example as well, a basic example of a neural network and compare it with tools that we have that we have been already sorry that we have already covered a simple linear regression or maybe a linear regression that was fitted with LASSO. So let's see the example that they mentioned it says it's just a regression problem. We're going to predict the salary of a baseball player in this year. Uh, based on performance statistics from the previous year. Uh, when you ignore missing responses, we have 263 inputs, and 19 predictors. Well, and then, of course, they do the training and testing split. But the idea is that, for example, for this, for this, for this model, of, for this linear model, we have 20 parameters, these 19 inputs, well, 19 predictors, and what we want to predict. Uh, when they perform lasso for these 19 predictors, they get to shrink the number of predictors up to 12. However, when they use a neural network, only using one hidden layer, so one set of activations, 
uh, they get the, the number of parameters that they needed to, to at least get to at least get a neural network that it wasn't so bad uh, as a predictor. They needed like almost a thousand parameters. And even now, if we compare, for example, what's the what was the mean absolute error for these models? We can see that even though for the neural network, uh, uh, the error is is higher than the other models, they're still pretty close. However, take into account that a lot of parameters have to be fitted. So maybe in computation time, these two models were much, much quicker to, to generate compared to this one. And really the gain, well, in this case, loss for accuracy of the model is really not that great I mean, because there is a very slight difference between this mean absolute error and also between this test set R squared. They are pretty similar. Uh, so, Lucy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, ju just a comment. Uh, remember, you know, this is a, 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 a traditional tabular data, right? The hitters uh, uh, data set, right? Yeah. Okay. So that, that's what I was telling you, that usually the deep learning models, they don't give you that much improvement, okay, from traditional me methods when we're dealing with this type of data, okay? But uh, an another thing that we have to also, you know, experiment is, for example, uh, if we can introduce more hidden layers, for example, and then some type of regularization, Maybe we can get a better, uh, a better model than the linear regression, even with the lasso. Okay, but then when we go to the tree-based models, right, the random forest and all that, then the deep learning really uh, struggles to to catch up. Okay, so usually you see deep learning more in image recognition, uh, speech, uh, NLP uh, type of situations and uh, time series, okay? Because time series, because they have a sequence, uh, the, the RNN and also what is called the LSTM models, a long short-term uh, memory, they do pretty well on forecasting than the traditional algorithms, even, you know, the gradient boosting. But, you know, that's basically, you know, a, 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 a sample of what we're talking about uh, at, at the beginning. Yeah, and I think another thing with this is like the idea of like deep learning being a black box and then you wouldn't know how to <laughs> predict, like use the model or it's not um interpretable what how the model is coming to its prediction. Right. Right. And and that's the other, you know, uh kind of weakness <laughs> that these models have because uh for example in imaging, if you want to explain exactly you know how the model is doing that, you have to explore all those parameters, right? All those weights that the model is uh, is taking into account. And, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a rabbit hole, really. <laughs> I see, thank you. Mm, yeah, but at least for, for this chapter, they don't, they don't do the comparison that you're mentioning. But in the case of non-tabular data, uh, I would guess that these models that we have already been covering, they, they do pretty bad for those. So it would be kind of unfair. Uh, well, this is a part of the fitting of the, of the neural network. Uh, I don't really see something interesting to add to this part. I mean, it's mainly mathematics. But there was an interesting section over here, right in the end. Uh, over here. Uh, about, about the shape that we have already, that we have already been encountering many times across this book. Uh, this, this sort of G shape uh, that comes up a lot in this. <laughs> Sorry, in these cases of bias variance traitors. And in particular, uh, for the test error, that it usually has a 
U shape where you have a global minimum. Uh, well, uh, and those uh, that particular step is that we used to take that uh, that level of flexibility as the one that we would choose for our model. Uh, but for the case of the training error, as we saw, it was mostly monotonically down uh, due to possible overfitting. However, they mentioned that, uh, well, that is not always the case. I didn't really get this part, but that, that is not always the case. And, and that it happens for, for this type of models. Let me see. Over here, this type of, of occurrence that it can happen that the test error has a U shape before this interpolation threshold is reached. So this part at which we usually stop in order to determine the, the exact flexibility that we wanted for our model to have. Uh, and this from, from this example that they show, let's see, they are getting a variable via this uniform distribution, uh, affecting it via this normal error. And this would be what we would want to predict. Um, and we can see over here, for example, when we have a, a not so high flexibility, uh, there is not quite a bit of overfitting. No, oh, wait, I'm not sure. Did anyone get this part? I wanted to mention it, but now I, I think I didn't get it quite right. Okay, go back to the picture. Oh. So, wait. So, I guess the orange is like the, um, the oranges are. Now, but like, uh, but yeah, okay, I'm not sure either. But it was yeah. okay, it says that it's mostly <clears throat> in comparison between these two cases. Uh, 42 and 20, it's for 22, let's see, it says uh, like less wild than 20, even though it's a higher degree of freedom. And similarly for 18, as is as a degree of freedom. So let's see in the image, 42, 42, 20, and 80. Ah, yeah. Well, I think it's mentioning the part that even though we are increasing, for example, when we go to 20, we saw that this predicted curve, this one, I think it's orange or yellow, uh, it has a training, a training error of zero because it's going along all of the points in the training that is in these circle dots. Uh, how, well, and it's also quite wiggly, so it probably does not generalize well because it's very far apart from this curve in black, that is a true pattern. However, because of this U-shape phenomenon, we would expect that because for 20 degrees of freedom, uh, the gender generalizability of our model has already gotten quite low, we would expect that for greater uh, values, well, for greater numbers of degrees of freedom, uh, a similar pattern would occur. So we would have even more and more wiggly lines and, and not a curve similar to this one in black. However, that is not the case because as we can see over here for 42 or 80 degrees in freedom, <clears throat> the generalizability of, of this curve is even greater than in the, in the last one. So the U shape did not quite happen there. 
in 20. So, I don't know, that's weird. I still like what you said. It was uh, for the eight, it was good enough. So, the global minimum probably was not at eight, but still, there were some quite good enough candidates, for example, 42 and 80, uh, where the general general stability or maybe the test error even of the model was not so bad compared to other values after eight for example compared to 20. so yeah there is no there is no u shape over here uh, well actually i think it meant there was the u shape i don't know if 20 would have been where it has the less like has the least um or rather has the most test error. But when I was rereading it, it's like, yeah, eight was like good. Eight was like the sweet spot. And then 20, if like the orange line is like the fitted line and any, like rather than predicting, like it's not following a true function, the black line as well. But then, so like that's the dip where your test error is like really big. But then when you go, keep going up, degrees of freedom then it gets better I guess that's what I'm seeing it as like eight was good then you went to 20 and uh, 20 degrees of freedom and then your your error like got way worse and then when you went back up to like 42 and 80 it was still better because mm -hmm. I think in the other like in the other ones it was just they were just kind of like straight lines straight lines intersecting but as far as like test error training error, I'm thinking. Yeah, I'm thinking of something like, I mean, not a not a U, but almost like a double U, but increasing in in a diagonal sense. I wanted to draw it, but uh, I don't have a whiteboard. And it's okay. Really, it's what you said, really. So I, that's the point that I wanted to to make on that was the thing really. Um, and really that's it for this chapter. Mm -hmm. We'll be covering, well, not the lab, but the exercises in the next one. Uh, and, let, and let's see what comes up next, survival analysis. Is anyone signed up for the 